All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXJS Weekly, episode 74, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, I guess I just want to say sorry for missing the previous podcast. I was a bit sick and then my uh, power supply died on my streaming computer. So I was essentially without any hardware for quite a few days. Uh, but yeah, um, now I'm back and, you know, healthy and with a working computer. So we can actually get to the JavaScript news that I totally forgot to open. So let me just do that right now. Uh, hey, not a number is a number. Welcome to the stream. That's a great username there. So as usual, we are starting with a getting started section that uh, contains all the articles that will get you started with a bunch of topics. With the first one today being unrevealed tips for unit testing with Jest. Uh, this is some really nice uh, tips if you are just getting started with Jest and don't know all of the features that it provides like mocking defaults, mocking uh, non-existent files and modules and large complex assertions on function calls and stuff like this. So um, yeah, if you're getting started with Jest and you want to know some pretty nice tips uh, to get you going and make your test simpler and nicer, then do check this one out. The next article we got here is React Hooks plus RxJS Facades. This is the pretty nice introduction that shows off how you can actually use RxJS uh, facades and specifically, I believe uh, it uses the Akita uh, library together with React in three ways, starting with uh, very old fashioned classes uh, or like component classes and data services when you, you know you write everything yourself essentially and go into the component classes with Akita Redux and data services and then go into the completely functional components with your custom hooks and Akita Redux, which actually looks pretty damn good. So if you're working either with Akita or you are a fan of RxJS or you maybe wanted to get started with that with React, then do check this one out. It does a pretty good job at introducing it and showing off how the hooks simplify a lot of things, to be honest. Next article we got here is create OS style backgrounds with a backdrop filter. So there's a new backdrop filter that's I, I'm not actually <clears throat> apologies, I'm not actually sure how new it is. But yeah, it's okay. So it's only shipped in uh, Chrome uh, version 76, I believe it's probably going to be in Firefox as well, since they are a bit more advanced on CSS side than uh, Chrome or at least tend to be. So there's a new background filter property allows you to well apply filters to the background. And uh, one of the options is to actually make a background blurry, which looks kind of like this, right, and uh, makes for very nice effects that look very desktop like or, you know, specifically Windows 10 or iOS, I think they really love uh, stuff like this. Now you can quite easily do that on the web as well. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There's quite a bunch of examples. And it looks like you can actually apply that filter to well, basically anything that's in the background of a div, which is pretty damn cool. So there you go. That sounds interesting. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is why react hooks. Uh, lengthy ish write up on react hooks, uh, why they were created and how exactly did it, you know, react evolved from the very beginning from react.create class to the react hooks that we have right now. So if you are started getting started with react, or maybe you were writing react for quite some time, and are not sure how exactly we got to hooks, and why do we need hooks at all, then this is for you. And there's also a video that basically explains the same thing if you prefer the video format. So do check it out. It's a great article. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. All right, next thing we got here is writing a simple MVC app in plain JavaScript. Uh, this is yeah, just as the title says is a pretty basic uh, MVC tutorial. So this is very much what you would expect from a model view controller styled application. It's all written in vanilla JavaScript, not using any frameworks or anything like that. So if you are just getting started with JavaScript, and if you are not familiar with MVC uh, model, or maybe you are, you know, read about it a bit, but not sure how exactly to build it, then this is for you, it will teach you how it works, what exactly is MVC, how to implement it yourself. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite good. But you know, you probably don't want to use it in this way in your uh, like real life applications, because while MVC is a good pattern, like there's some downsides to rolling your own framework, essentially. <laughs> Nonetheless, a really good learning article. So make sure to check it out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is next JS practical introduction. I believe this is part two or three of the series. 
Uh, this time around, it talks about navigation and routing. So if you are getting started with Next.js and you were confused as to how the navigation and routing works, this article got you covered. It does explain how exactly the Next.js handles the pages navigation, how to use the link to uh, do the you know prefetching and all that kind of stuff. There is quite a few interesting points here. So um, yeah, again, if you're getting started with Next.js and you didn't know about those bits, do check it out. It does a pretty good job of explaining it. Next thing we got here is ES proposal optional chaining. So because I missed the last podcast, I was not able to talk about that, but I, this is one of the proposals that I'm really excited about, right? So optional chaining has been moved to stage three, which means it's nearly there. And I'm hoping we're going to see it shipped in Chrome and Node.js, maybe even Node.js 12 in the next months. And uh, yeah, so this, this, um, Article does a deep dive looking into how the optional chaining proposal works, how the question mark dot operator works, and how you can apply it to uh, object properties, dynamic properties, and functions, which is, I think this is like this, and the um, uh, pattern matching are two of the proposals that I cannot wait for to be shipped in production because they are, they're gonna make your code a lot easier. There's also some really neat tricks in here. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's like, as I said, you know, this is like one of my favorite um, additions to JavaScript and I cannot wait to actually be able to use it without any translation. So there we go. Next article we got here is writing your own React custom hooks, a pretty nice tutorial explaining how to create your own reusable React hooks. So if you're just getting started with React hooks, it's a really good starting point that will explain to you and show on a specific example how to extract existing code into your custom React hook that can be reused across components. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. And the last thing we got here is first, blah, blah, blah. let me try that again. First class functions in JavaScript. A pretty good write up on uh, first class, like explaining that the functions in JavaScript are first class citizen and what exactly that means and how you can use them. I think this was one of the concepts uh, concepts that took me quite a bit to understand and figure out. But once I did, it made things like callbacks, promises, and you know, chains a lot easier. So if you're still not sure what what basically the functions being first class citizens means, then I would highly recommend reading through this article. It's not that long, but it will probably explain quite a bit to you, and a lot of things will become a lot easier once you grasp this concept. All right, that is actually it for the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles and news section. We don't really have that many things this week. I guess, you know, it's August, so kind of vacation time. A lot of people are on vacation, so there's not too many things to discuss, but hey, let's just get going. So the first thing we got here today is uh, in the article section is React Redux and Comlink of main thread. The pretty neat example of how you can take Redux store and move it into the worker, right? Uh, moving it eff effectively, moving it off the main thread to offload all the heavy computations or well, not maybe not so heavy computations. Uh, in that case, you probably don't really need that. But uh, yes, just showing how you can move your Redux store off the main thread into the web worker that would essentially speed up your application updates and make them non-blocking for your UI re-renders, even though React does a really good job in doing that yourself. I mean, if you have any CPU intensive stuff, for example, in the background, it's always a good idea to move that into the worker, right? This article does a very good job of showing off how exactly you can do that uh, using Comlink, which makes uh, interacting with uh, web workers quite a bit simpler. So instead of, you know, doing everything yourself, you can just use comlink expose function that does everything for you basically, uh, which is super convenient. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. This is a really uh, neat article. Next thing we got here is dependency injection in Node.js. A pretty nice write up on uh, what is dependency injection? Why do we need it? And how to use it specifically with the Avilix uh, dependency injection container library. Um, I personally am not a big fan of dependency injection. I, you know, as you might know, I prefer functional programming and in functional programming, dependency injection is just basically passing functions around. It's like 90% of the time. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, if you're doing a lot of object oriented programming, uh, this is indeed a very helpful concept. And uh, this article will basically introduce you to it quite nicely and also show off this in the Avilix uh, library that makes it quite a bit easier to work with dependency injection in JavaScript. All right, next article we got here is Cypress IO, the Selenium killer. 
A pretty good write-up that introduces you to Cypress IO, which is a testing, end-to-end -end testing framework. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, it might be a Selenium killer, but I wouldn't actually phrase it this way because Selenium allows you to do cross-browser testing, right? So it works with Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Internet Explorer, and basically everything else out there because it's old, it is widely adopted, and there's like billions of plugins for it, right? It is slow and there's like downsides to it. There's a lot of problems with it. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it does have a wide support and there's like a lot of, you know, pretty big community around it. Uh, while Cypress is relatively new and only works with Chrome, but I tried Cypress in a couple of projects and it has been really good. Like it is miles better than uh, Selenium. And yes, okay, it has downside of, for now it only works with Chrome and or Chromium specifically. And there are some, you know, minor issues with setting it up for cross-platform stuff. Uh, at least I had them. Maybe it's no longer the case because I tried it last time, like half a year ago. I do know that they are developing it quite uh, rapidly. So nonetheless, it's a very nice write-up uh, that compares Cypress to Selenium essentially and um, talks about the advantages and disadvantages of one over another. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. I guess, you know, the... Most important bit is that Cypress only supports Chromium and well, yeah, Electron basically, right? So because this is what it's built on. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a really neat tool. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. All right, last thing we got here in articles is do React hooks replace Redux? TLDR, hooks are great, but no, which is, you know, kind of predictable. So this talks about React hooks and uh, this is the sentiment that I think I've seen quite a lot of times, like, hey, use hooks to replace re Redux setup. And while you can do the global state management using hooks, it is, and it works perfectly fine on a, you know, small scale applications, even medium sized maybe, you won't be able to pull that off uh, with replacing Redux in a really big applications, right? So the Redux is, is well, first of all, it's actually not, um, pattern, it's it's an architecture, right? It's what you do when you have to manage the global state while hooks is well, it's just hooks, it's, it's a way of managing internal react things like lifecycle and state. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the article does a pretty good job of um, outlining what is kind of wrong with this comparison, why you shouldn't actually compare that and when to use hooks specifically and when to use Redux specifically. Um, I will note that the article is written by Eric Elliott, who is, well, he got some great articles out there, but he tends to be just a bit too extreme in his views, let's put it this way. So uh, do read the article, but take it with a grain of salt. Don't take his uh, extreme outlines on the things on both Redux and Hooks. As granted, there's always a bit more leeway than I think he usually writes about, at least in my opinion, you know. So there we go. All right, this is it for articles and news. Now we go to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We do have uh, three stories here. So the first one is the, the team behind the storybook is introducing the new component story format that is essentially a simple, portable, and future-proof component example format. So the idea is that you no longer have um, format like before, you know, they, they had their own like function calls that you had to write to expose specific story for a specific module, which was a bit of a pain in ass to maintain from what I've read and not that flexible. And now they are just switching to using ES modules, which is, well, first of all, a lot easier to read. And second of all, a lot more flexible, which also means that you can actually take any other existing format like MDX, GFM, and so on and so forth, and just compile it to uh, CSF, which again is just ES modules right now which actually looks pretty great. And it's also a lot easier to write tests around that and stuff like this. So if you're working with Storybook, make sure to check this out because this looks like a pretty good improvement. Next thing we got here is tips and tricks for mocking in JavaScript tests. It's just like a couple of really nice tricks that, uh, for example, like I use Synon uh, quite a bit in a bunch of tests, but I didn't know that it has fake timers. I never, I guess I should have read the documentation for Synon completely, but you can actually fake timers with Synon so that your time the test produce is always the same. I had this, like this is, it's always a pain in the ass when you work with dates like in logs or whatever, and you have to test with timers. So you have to do something uh, to, you know, figure out a way essentially to always get the repeatable time and 
timestamps, right? So it's it's always annoying as hell. And with Synon, it just becomes as easy as, okay, use fake timers. Here's the fake date that is now done, right? This is like, this is awesome. There's also a geo mock that I didn't know about that allows you to mock geolocation in browsers and a bunch of other uh, minor tricks here. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. The last thing we got here today is the malicious code in a pure script NPM installer. Yet another compromised package in NPM. This time around, it was actually pretty trivial. One of the maintainers uh, claims that his account was compromised and basically the uh, attacker just injected malicious code and published it instead of him. Uh, luckily, it was noticed quite quickly and quite quickly removed and fixed basically. So, you know, I guess at this point, it's not, not much of a news anymore because NPM reacted uh, pretty fast um, anyway. But yeah, it's just, you know, a reminder, I guess, to enable two-factor authentication on your accounts and uh, to be careful about security of your passwords. All right, now we are coming to the releases section. We do have quite a few here today, actually. Uh, the first big release of the week is Chrome 6, uh, 76 and... Uh, Comes with a bunch of pretty nice improvements. So you finally have the Omnibox install button instead of the pop-up that annoys you every time you go to the progressive web app. So this is a very welcome improvement. Um, there's, they also give you more control over the progressive web app mini info bar on the uh, mobile devices. So you can actually now prevent the display of the default one and make your own custom one in the app if you want to. Um, yeah, so there's like a bunch of other stuff like dark mode support, promise dot will settle that now shipped. Uh, the reading blobs can now be done with a dot text array buffer and stream API. And the images uh, in a synchronous clipboard API are now shipped so you can actually use them in production. That is, I think, it. The next release we got here is Electron 6. And this is actually probably the most exciting release of the week. Not because it's, you know, another version of Electron, but actually because they managed to release Electron 6 that now ships with Chromium 76 and Node.js 12.4 on exactly the same day the Chromium 76 was released. So it was the same day release with the latest version of Chromium in Electron. This is mind-blowing. Like, it, just look at the history of Electron and actually it usually took them... Well, quite a long time to ship the new version of Electron that updated the Chromium, updated the Node.js, updated the V8, and it always was lagging quite a bit behind, like at least a few versions. Now, they release it on the same day, which is just freaking awesome. So um, yeah, I guess good news for all the Electron people. All right, continuing, we got a Lighthouse version 5.2.0. I mean, normally you wouldn't actually use it separately and you would use it as a part of the DevTools, right? So you got the Audits tab. Uh, why I wanted to highlight this is uh, so the, the DevTools themselves, the Lighthouse uh, 5.2 will ship in Chrome 77, which is going to be coming in September. But I just want to highlight this because um, there is this new feature that is called third party usage. Uh, There's going to be audit to audits, which just sounds pretty awesome. So it's basically a new performance diagnostic that shows a breakdown of third party resources in the page and the time bytes needed to load them. So right now, if you do audit, right, you just get the uh, general information about the resources, about the speed of loading and stuff like this, and then some hints on accessibility, best practices, so on and so forth, right? And currently, they just show you the audits in general. Like it just tells you, hey, your JavaScript is too big, or hey, your CSS is too big, or you remove unused CSS because you have like, GitHub have um, almost 100 kilobytes of unused CSS, okay? <laughs> Um, yeah, but you know, it doesn't discriminate between the CSS served locally and CSS and JavaScript that you load from the uh, CDN, for example, right? And the version 5.2 actually will add this specific separate info that says, hey, this, you know, this stuff from CDN that you load over here, be it JavaScript libraries or CSS, slows your page a lot and is very expensive and you're not using all of it. So, hey, maybe, you know, integrate the parts that you need into your website, which just sounds pretty amazing. So I cannot wait for this to be released. Again, you know, it's Chrome 77, which means that, um, so the Lighthouse itself has already been released, which means you can already install, I believe it should be already in the beta version of Chromium. So, uh, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next release we've got here is HTM 2.2. 
if you are using it, um, there is some pretty exciting things. So the uh, they now support for mixed static and dynamic property values. Um, and there was a pretty good tweet from uh, Mr. Develop It. Da, 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 da. Let me just quickly find them that illustrates how cool that is. So this is a feature that is not actually supported by um, where is it? There we go. It is not supported by JSX, right? So HTML, this HTML, uh, the HTML library is aimed to be the replacement for JSX that you can use without pre-compilation. It works actually really well. And now you can do things like this, right? So you can dynamically ins insert components, inline them with a template literal. And you can also dynamically inline parts of the attributes, which are, you know, dynamic or static or whatever. And, and this, this works, like you cannot do this in JSX. This just will not work, which is uh, pretty damn impressive to be honest. I mean, obviously JSX has a different way of doing that, right? But you cannot inline them in this way, which is kind of great. So uh, if you never heard about JSX, oh, sorry, HTM, do give it a shot. It is actually pretty neat and uh, yeah, really cool. Came out across MDXJS. Uh, MDX is quite awesome. Um, I, I don't know why I tried to open MDXJS, but uh, there we go. Yes, MDX is a pretty neat format. Uh, we are currently using it in uh, building our new website and it is Really awesome when you can, you know, you can have a markdown that is can be easily edited and then you can just integrate the React components that render more advanced stuff right into it. This works amazingly well. Cat, what are you now? Like my cat is just going crazy. I don't know if you guys can hear him, but uh, if you hear strange sounds from the background, that's my cat and he ran away. Okay, continuing, we got tiny date version 1.2.0. Um, I, uh, so I wanted to highlight this because I found this uh, new feature with a custom dictionary to be pretty awesome. So the idea is that you can take a date and you can format it uh, in a way where you define the templates yourself. As in, you know, you say, okay, so the, we have this MMM, DD and YYY, where YYY is the standard one, right? And then MMM and DD is something that you can actually define yourself, which um, yeah, it just looks really cool. So uh, if you are working with dates and you wanted a super tiny date with a custom um, templating, flexible templating, do check this one out. This is pretty awesome. So it from, a, I believe DocZ actually uses, so they released a the version 2.0. I believe I covered it a couple of podcasts ago and they are now using Gatsby as a base for it. And uh, yeah. Right, so I, uh, wait a second there, they had a blog and I remember if I remember correctly, exactly. So this is this was already covered on the podcast at one point. They are now using Gatsby as a bundler and MDX essentially is very tightly coupled with Gatsby and you know, a sort of sub project of Gatsby, I guess I would even go as far as to say that. And uh, yeah, it works surprisingly well. But okay, coming back to releases, last release we got uh, for this week is Preact JS version 10 RC1. So if you're using Preact JS and uh, want to help testing out the pre-release version of uh, version 10, make sure to check this one out, install it, test it, uh, see how it works for you and report any bugs you might find. All right, this is it for the releases. Now we got a bunch of libraries and uh, some neat demos this time around. So we're gonna see how this goes. Uh, hopefully it does not crash like a couple of times it did before. But okay, let's start with the libraries first. So we got the uh, Cesium, I hope that's how you read it. Um, it's an open source JavaScript library for world-class 3D globes and maps. It allows you to render FGL globes and maps uh, with basically you know, rendering the surfaces via the satellites, for example, or overlaying the information that you can uh, find anywhere on the globe. It like it looks very nice and the API is really cool and they have like a billion of use cases and demos from community from guys like you know like there's NASA storm visualization globe for, for example which is really damn impressive. Uh, most of the demos have the screenshots and um, explanations. Uh, some of the demos are private, so you want to be able to see them. Some of them are public, like the Storm Virtual Globe from NASA. So you can actually open the demo itself and uh, check it out if you want to. Uh, it's very heavy, so I won't do that right now. But yeah, it's really neat. So if you're working with um, world 
visualizations and wanted to do a fancy globes, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Overview, a prototyping tool for view developers. Um, it actually looks pretty neat. So it allows you to drag and drop uh, view components and then link the pages and just design your website, I guess, prototype your website in this way. Um, looks quite neat. So, you know, if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It seems to also export the stuff uh, as a resulting like view project, uh, which sounds quite handy. So maybe that sounds useful for you. Do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Docker server, super lightweight and simple restful uh, server for running Docker containers on a remote machine in a secure way. Essentially it just exposes a REST API with authentication for your Docker, allows you to run uh, basic Docker commands like you know starting, stopping containers and stuff like this uh, using REST API. Um, Again, you know, it expects that you, you just run Docker commands. So there's nothing like transferring files or anything like that. So if you're looking for um, just, yeah, I guess executing Docker commands, look at this. And if you wanna do deployments, uh, there is Exaframe that I wrote and it's really good. So do check this one out. <laughs> just shamelessly shitting my own stuff. Okay. Next thing we got here is Frontless, a uh, Node.js stack for universal JavaScript applications. This is a combination of Feathers.js, Riot.js, Turbolinks, and Express.js that basically uh, includes SSR and allows you to build universal or isomorphic JavaScript apps based on this stack. So if you are working with Riot, Feathers, and uh, Turbolinks, and Express, uh, do check this one out. It seems like a pretty nice combination. I personally am too attached to Next.js to switch to anything, but this looks quite good actually. Next thing we got here is Conformance, a module to check SPDX license expressions, conformance and surface meta information about license expressions. This allows you to uh, execute this on uh, basically your repo and see what kind of licenses does it has, see the SPDX links, see the SPDX uh, conformance and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it looks quite nice. So, you know, if you're working a lot with the licenses, do check it out, maybe this is useful to you. Next thing we got here is builder.io, drag and drop page builder for any website. So this is a bit more complex than the overview. And uh, the neat thing is actually, so they have the hosted version that is paid. You can like, you know, buy it and get it, or there's an open source version that you can build yourself. And um, the amount of frameworks they support is actually pretty crazy. So, you know, starting from the REST APIs, React, Next.js, Web Components, Angular, React Native and Beta, which is quite impressive. They also support email, app, preact, view with uh, web components, and then um, a bunch of other stuff that is essentially extendable using their API. So it looks quite neat. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Again, it's open source, so you probably can self-host that if you uh, so desire, but uh, yeah, it looks pretty neat. Next thing we got here is the Atomize React design system for React.js. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a design system with a bunch of uh, templates uh, and, you know, design things like themes and containers and grids and divs and images inputs. Looks quite nice. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. Again, was built specifically for React, uh, has a bunch of demos and stuff. Um, looks pretty sweet. So yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Okay. Next thing we got here is React device frames, uh, device frame components for React. Uh, this is essentially an SVGs that you can use to wrap your content, your demos around with that, um, yeah, essentially just uh, show off your demo in a nice placeholder. Um, can be handy from time to time. Next thing we got here is IO808, an attempt to fully recreate web-based TR808 drum machine that is actually damn impressive. So this is the thing. It is fully interactive, it works. You can start, stop it. It produces the bits and there's like tracks and levels and, and all the knobs, that, all of that works. And this is insane and it's really awesome. And it's open source, so you know, that sounds interesting. You can even check how it was built. Okay, next thing we got here is Confusables, um, tiny library that allows you to easily remove or add Confusables to a string. So it, meaning Confusables, you know, is the letters that kind of look like the normal Latin letters, but actually from the other languages, 
that is easily to confuse with the original letters, like, you know, the Unicode symbols and stuff like this. So it actually allows you to either uh, remove or obfuscate even worse, basically. <laughs> oh yeah, can be handy for some cases, I guess. Okay, next thing we got here is treeverse. Um, walk any kind of tree structure depths or bread first. Uh, so this, yeah, it's essentially three traversal a library for JavaScript. If you are doing a lot of tree traversals, uh, then do check this one out. I guess, you know, if you're not working with trees, it's not gonna be very useful. But uh, yeah, looks uh, looks quite nice. Okay, next thing we got here is .env flow. This is an extension to .env library that actually loads environmental variables, not just from one environment. So normally, you know, if you create .env file and you run your app, you would load the environmental variables only from one file, right? So if you have like .env development and you run in development, it will be only loaded from there. Well, this library actually allows you to combine multiple files. And so you have like .env, you have .env local, development, test, production, and production local. And depending on your flags, it will load. So like if you go development, it will actually load your .env and then add development on top of it, overriding the values, which uh, can actually be quite damn useful. Uh, so yes, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, Prime React is quite nice. What is Prime React? Prime React, Prime, uh, oh, it's a UI framework. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. That actually looks, oh, wait, have I, I, th I feel like I have seen it somewhere already, but that looks pretty slick. I, I'm, how big is it? Uh, my, my, all, like my first question uh, package phobia is where I typically go first and then we go, what, I broke something. Ah, oh, there we go. Six megabytes, that is a big ass framework. <laughs> okay, um, doesn't have a GitHub repo or something. GitHub, there we go. Uh, the next question would be, is it tree shakeable? Um, okay, at least it has the named imports, so maybe it is, but this is like six megabytes for a UI framework is a lot. It does look pretty slick. Okay, let's continue. So the next thing we got here is Caporel JS, a full featured framework for building command line apps with Node.js. Um, yeah, it looks quite nice. It looks very similar to Yargs, for example. That is my preferred uh, command line um, framework. It seems to have the TypeScript definitions integrated. I'm not sure how it works with the uh, Yargs because I'm not a TypeScript user. But um, yeah, if you're for some reason not happy with Yargs, do check this one out. It actually looks quite good. All right. Next thing we got here is Semiotic, a data visualization framework for React. So this is essentially yet another version of React plus D3.js um, combined together in nice components. And uh, yeah, the API look really slick. So essentially you have the data in the same format that D3.js accepts and then you just uh, spread it into the one of the components essentially and it works um, pretty, I mean, yeah, the, it has quite a bunch of visualizations and the API seems nice and it seems to work really well, to be honest. So, and has some, yeah, really fancy stuff like home run map. <laughs> um, there you go, yeah. But this, I guess if you visualize data with D3.js and React and you don't wanna build your own uh, wrappers for D3, do check this one out, it looks quite nice. Okay, next thing we got here is React to print, print React components in the browser. So essentially a specific library that allows you to point to any existing React component, which will then make it print friendly. Uh, for example, in this case, they do give the example of the table and uh, yeah, just uh, invoke the printing. Um, so I guess if you work with React a lot and need to print specific components, then this can help you quite a bit. Okay. Next thing we got here is Miba Farm, evolving life simulation written in vanilla JS, full of living, feeding, breeding, mutating Mebas. This is like, as it says, life simulation, and uh, it actually is absolutely fascinating. So, if you ever were interested in simulating stuff and um, you know, like genetics and everything, there's like a bunch of knobs you can tweak if you want to. And uh, yeah, I, I have zero understanding of the whole like genetics area. But this seems to be really awesome. So if you have any interest in that, do check it out. Again, you know, the whole source code is open on uh, GitHub. So you can actually have a look at how it was implemented or just play around with the farm itself, which, you know, I, I, last time I spent like 20 minutes clicking on all those things. 
trying to figure out how that works. Um, hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. Uh, but okay, <clears throat> continuing. Uh, last demo we have here today is Diablo 1. Yes, this is full on Diablo 1 compiled for the web and working and running. And yes, you can play it on the phone as well, which is pretty damn impressive. So uh, it is open source. You can actually have a look at the source code. It is based on the project called Devolution, which was a rewrite of uh, Diablo engine, I believe. It is a C project. So the way it works is essentially it they took, the author took the uh, Devolution compiler to WebAssembly, added some additional codes to glue it all together. And it even have save games. Like I played last time for, I don't know, half an hour. And yes, all of that works. You can like kill monsters, you can get loots. It, it, it is mind blowing that you can run this in the browser and you can run it in uh, on a mobile phone, as I said. So the tapping works perfectly fine, uh, which is damn impressive. The cool thing is that by default, you play a shareware version of Diablo 1, which was distributed on the uh, CDs back in the days. So it's like, you know, first few levels, uh, for few, yeah. first few floors of a dungeon, essentially. But there is a way, so you can um, load in the um, diab.mpq file, which is the whole game, essentially, right, by clicking on the specific link here. And if you do that, you can actually play the whole game in your browser by, or, you know, on a mobile phone, for example, which is, yeah, this is pretty damn impressive. I'm, I'm really excited to see where the gaming in the browser will go with, uh, you know, um, I guess improvements of the web assembly and adding of the multi-threading and stuff like this to it. So yes, now you can play Diablo in a browser. Okay, that is it for the libraries and demos. I've got two interesting and I guess silly things to show off to wrap this up. First one is this um, some, like medium sized thread, let's just put it this way, that starts with a tweet. I saw a tweet asking why sometimes when you unsubscribe from an email list, it says it can take a few days. Buckle up as I have a ridiculous story about this happening in the enterprise. And I would just suggest, you know, you go and read, spend like five minutes reading this thread and uh, it is absolutely ridiculous how some of the larger companies works, like people sending emails manually to unsubscribe you from mailing list and it is Jesus Christ. <laughs> just, you know, just take five minutes and read it. It's totally worth it. It's absolutely amusing and yeah. Um, right, uh, quick, it says you stream on Saturday uh, 9.00 Eastern Standard Time. Am I missing something? Uh, nope, I am off. Um, I mean, I don't, like I've, <laughs> I actually been super lazy to update streaming times in on both Twitch on my channel and on the website. Um, well, that should be paused. Okay, uh, 3 p.m. Yeah, okay, I definitely should update. This is wrong. This is, I typically stream at around 1 p.m. Sest, uh, so Central European time. Uh, this is quite wrong and I've just been lazy as hell to actually update that to a proper time, I'm sorry. But uh, you can you can follow me on Twitter and you can follow our Discord server where I post announcements uh, about like a couple of hours before I go live. Um, yeah, so please, <laughs> I should just take, you know, five minutes to update those things because yeah, this is not very good. Uh, it's my fault, sorry. <laughs> okay, and the last thing I got to show off here is this cat meme adapted to uh, people with no idea AI about AI saying, it will take over the world and my neural network that highlights cat as a dog. This is probably the best description of, you know, the fear of AI um, I've seen like out there <laughs> and the neural networks that at least, at least this is how my neural networks work. You know, any neural networks that I trained, they ended up being absolute garbage. <laughs> and this is just a perfect depiction of this whole fear of AI. But, um, yeah, this is basically it from my side. So this was BXGS Weekly episode 74. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub or on bxgs.dev. Uh, as I already said, we have a Discord server that you can join to ask questions or discuss this stuff or just chat or, you know, talk about video games. Um, yeah, that's basically it from my side. If you guys have any questions or suggestions, uh, throw it into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap it up here and uh, go have, 
I don't know, I guess I'm gonna go play Warframe because there are some uh, very nice events going on around. They have balls for Kavats. I need a ball for my Kavats. So like, why would I not have that? Uh, but yeah. Okay, um, give you guys a couple more minutes to um, throw in your questions if you have any. Otherwise, again, Discord server, you can follow me on Twitter if you wanna know stream times, I do announce it. Um, in advance, basically, I will try to stick to schedule better. I'm just really bad at that lately. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, GitHub at building X with JS. Um, again, BXJS weekly repo specifically for this. And uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's it. Cool meme. Yes, the meme is like this. This thing made me laugh a lot more than it should have in, in the <laughs> initial place. But okay. Seems like no more questions, no more suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for following me. Thank you for your continued support. Um, yeah, I guess have a great rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching the VOD and I see you next time. Bye.